WrestleMania 6, right here. This event was the first ever WWF pay-per-view which was taken outside of the United States. And they only took it next door, but they took it to Toronto's Skydome in Toronto, Canada. The card was headlined by Hulk Hogan, WWF World Heavyweight Champion against the Ultimate Warrior, the Intercontinental Heavyweight Champion. Hulk Hogan, the guy who'd been the pinnacle the centre point, the centre forward, the poster boy of the World Wrestling Federation for so long, for a good five, six years now, was going up against the up-and-comer, the ultimate warrior. Everyone expected it to be this grand passing of the torch moment, but how would it work out? We'll go on to find that out at the end of the video. Now, I'll start at the beginning. This show was attended by a little Adam Copeland. About in his teenage years, he ended up becoming Edge, and he used to always say like afterwards, like this, this show and this time period for him was so important in molding him, him into the pro wrestling fan that he became afterwards. And when he was tag team champions with Hulk Hogan, he used to be like, "Oh, I can't believe I was tag team champions with Hogan. I watched it at WrestleMania six, twelve years ago, and all that." And it's really interesting to see that that can happen. So just think, any of you going to WrestleMania this year, you could be. Headlining pay-per-views in 12 years time with CM Punk as tag team champions. Imagine that. Right, here we go. First match on the card, Rick Martel versus Coco Beware. Coco Beware, the good guy. And for all the stick that he ever gets for being in the Hall of Fame, in this match he really performed. And it really shows the difference between the standards that were set back then and the standards that people are allowed to get away with now. Because they don't have the same learning system right now as they do back then the guys nowadays cannot perform to the same levels well in some cases as these guys the guys back then had the basics down to a T whereas these guys nowadays they don't really have the basics but they sort of have the other stuff to like put around it anyway in this match Rick Martel beats Coco Beware with um, Boston Crab I uh, can't remember what the model Rick Martel used to call it but yeah it's a Boston Crab um, Rick Martel in his home country of Canada so it was a nice little thing to just give him the win here and again, like I said, the, the both guys performed in this match. It was a decent little match. Then we had Demolition versus Andre the Giant and Haku. And I had to check what he said on the back of here because I noticed later on in the card the card is wrong. But yeah, Demolition versus Andre the Giant and Haku. The crowd here was so into it. They were so into de Demolition and they were so behind them. And uh, the Demolition ended up getting the win when they knocked Andre back. And he tangled himself up in the ropes and he couldn't get out of the ropes. And then they double teamed Haku. They hit the demolition finisher. I can't remember what they used to call it. And they got the pin. One, two, three. Demolition. New WWF Tag Team Champions. Then after the match, Bobby Heenan's irate. He gets in the ring and he starts slapping Andre the Giant around. And Andre the Giant goes fucking mental. Grabs hold of him and paint brushes him. Chucks him to the ground. And then Haku tries to throw a kick Andre. Catches it and nails him. Then everyone tries to get in the car, Andre says, fuck off you lot, I'm getting in this car, Andre gets in it, and goes backstage, but yeah, the fans are really into it, Demolition were so over back then, they were such a fantastic tag team, one of my favourite tag teams of all time, if not the favourite tag team of mine, um, yeah, fantastic match, then we had Brutus Beefcake versus Mr. Perfect, Mr. Perfect versus Brutus Beefcake, now Brutus Beefcake, I've probably said it before in these video videos of mine, he wasn't the best of workers, however, because Mr. Perfect was so good, and he was, as he goes on year by year, he was progressing so well. And this was probably around his peak time, WrestleMania 6. I probably like WrestleMania 7, WrestleMania 8 was probably around his peak. But, um. Perfect was so good in this. He carried Boots Beefcake to a great match. I say great match, it wasn't great. A good match, a good solid match. Perfect scored for him really, really well. The, this is why guys like Dolph Ziggler nowadays get compared to. Um, Mr. Perfect, because the the same mannerisms, and you can say that it's just about the hair, it's nothing about the hair, it's just the same mannerisms, the way they, act, they have similar traits, especially when uh, Mr. Perfect was in that stage of his career that Ziggler's in now. So yeah, Brutus Beefcake ended up getting the win after the match, he wanted to cut Kurt Henning's hair, but Mr. Perfect ran out of there, slash Kurt Henning, and then the genius, he caught all of the genius, he was Perfect's manager, and then Barber gave the genius a bit of a haircut. The genius, of course, is Macho Man Randy Savage's brother. Now then, next match, Bad News Brown versus Roddy Roddy Piper in very strange circumstances. Roddy Roddy Piper, I mentioned on my WrestleMania 3 video, so this is three years before this event ever took place, that it was Roddy Piper's retirement match. Now, I'm pretty sure he wrestled the year before. No, he didn't wrestle the year before. He was on a Piper's Pit segment with Morton Downey Jr. and Brother Love. However, 
This year, WrestleMania 6, he came back and he had a match and it was against Bad News Brown and he came to the ring with half of his entire body painted black. Now, obviously I understand that he, he probably didn't mean it in a racial terms, he was just joking around, but still, it's a bit controversial and you wouldn't get away with it nowadays, but for the time, I suppose, uh, ignorance was bliss. The match was just a brawl. You could tell Bad News was really limited in the ring. Uh, even though I did enjoy the character, he was really limited in terms of ring style. Him and Piper just brawled a little bit, and Danny Davis, the referee, would try and keep them away from each other as much as possible. And even the commentators were like, oh, what's Danny Davis doing? He's keeping them away from each other. Why is he separating them? And, like, they were pointing out so many flaws in the match, and, like, Piper put on a glove at one point and started hitting him with it, and then it was having a massive effect on Bad News Brown. The commentator was like, the referee's not checking the glove. It could have a foreign object implanted inside it to make his punches harder. And it's just, like... The psychology was really off in the match, cause, especially because the commentators just pointed it all out and was like, look, this is what's wrong, we're going to tell you all about it. Ended in a double count out, so, or double disqualification, can't remember, it was one of those stupid finishes that didn't really mean anything. Next up we had the Hart Foundation versus Nikolai Volkov and Boris Zhukov. Now, Boris Zhukov, I've only ever seen him on these WF pay-per-views. I have no idea, apart from any like part of these things, whatever he did in pro wrestling, I have no idea what he's done. This match ended in literally, like, 25 seconds when the Bolsheviks were singing their national anthem at the start of the match and the Hart Foundation decided to attack them from behind. Bear in mind the Hart Foundation are the face tag team and they're attacking these guys from behind while they're singing their national anthem. Very heelish move to do. And then they got the, the finish on them after 25 seconds and like, it was like, ooh, I suppose that's all right. But they sort of, they only did it because they mentioned earlier on in the night that whoever won the tag team title match that the Hart Foundation have challenged them to a match in which case the Hart should really go on before the tag team title match because logic dictates the titles go above the number one contenders match anyway the Hart's got the win very short match nothing to say about it they had the Barbarian versus Tito Santana I've said before Santana was a great worker this match passed by with nothing really spectacular to talk about Barbarian ended up getting the win the only thing I would say about it is that Barbarian was still dressed as um, Powers of Pain Barbarian rather than the Barbarian that he became in the next year or two. So this might have been just around the time that him and Warlord split up. I don't know, maybe Warlord was injured or something. Next up we had Dusty Rhodes and Sapphire versus Macho Man Randy Savage and Sensational Sherry. Also, the beginning of the match, Dusty Rhodes says, Oh, we got the crown jewels, baby. We got your crown jewel. You're not the Macho King. I got your crown jewel, and I was like, what's a crown jewel? And then, of course, Miss Elizabeth walks out there, and then she sides with Dusty Rhodes, the face. Because, Randy Savage, you've been a bad boy. I can't side with you because you've been naughty. <coughs> this match is all right for an intergender tag match. Um, obviously, Dusty Rhodes and Randy Savage did a lot of the work, and um, Sensational Sherry had to do a hell of a lot of the work for Sapphire, because Sapphire wasn't a wrestler. She was probably just an actress they paid to play this role. Um, yeah, Sherry did really well in this match. The, both men did really well. Then uh, Elizabeth got involved a little bit, and Dusty Rhodes and Sapphire ended up getting a win. Then they had a little dance off in the, at the end. And um, Elizabeth joined in, and she just looked so awkward. She was just like dancing like this. And I was just looking like she looks just so awkward in there. Like you can just tell she's just got no flow to her, no rhythm. Next up, the Rockers lost to the Iron Express in a match that I don't really understand because the Rockers. Well, obviously, we know what happened to Shawn Michaels, became like one of the biggest wrestlers of all time, but why would you put the Iron Express over the Rockers? Maybe it was something to punish the Rockers because they were acting up at the time, which wouldn't surprise me because apparently they were both knobheads at the time. So, yeah, the Iron Express got the win. This match was quite good. The Rockers did a lot of nice little double moves together. Um, next up, Jim Duggan beats Dino Bravo in a match that none of you ever will want to watch. Um, just a typical match with two guys that are really limited. Duggan ended up cheating to win. This is a, a thing that happened a lot on this card. It was the good guys used to cheat a lot to win, which I don't really understand. Um, yeah, Duggan, Duggan cheated. Duggan cheated. Duggan cheated to beat Dino Bravo. And that's all I really got to say. He used these 2 by 4 And later on, someone was like, oh, it's not a foreign object. It's a Canadian object. So it's all right in Canada. Huh? Not funny. Boring. Anyway... Teddy Biossi next versus Jake Robertson, a good match. Jake Robertson cut a great promo before it saying, listen, my, uh, Teddy Biossi, you 
are always making people beg for your money and they're not giving it on. You embarrass them, you put them down, well, I'm going to do the same thing to you. I'm going to take your uh, million dollar title, I'm going to make you beg for it back. How ironic would that be? You'd be, you'd be the victim of your own greed and success. In the end, uh, DiBiase had like a million dollar dream on, this is a spot I didn't understand. DiBiase had the million dollar dream, which is like a cross-faced chicken wing for anyone who doesn't know. Or Jake Snake Roberts on the outside. Then Jake sort of ducked out, hits DiBiase into the ring post, and then Snake falls to the floor, DiBiase falls to the floor, then DiBiase gets back up and gets in the ring. Now obviously Jake's just been uh, lessened by the million dollar dream, but the fact that DiBiase just had his face rammed into the pole would have thought that he'd be knocked out too, but DiBiase got up in the, in, back into the ring and won by a count out. Um, again, nothing too amazing. Then we had the big boss man beating Akeem, they used to be a tag team and then they broke up. As you can tell from this card, a lot of the stuff doesn't really have deep storyline implications towards it. Obviously you have the Elizabeth stuff coming back, you have... Um, the Hearts winning that match to look, making them look strong so they can go into a feud with the Demolition. Also, that was another important thing. And then Andre leaving Bobby Heenan. But apart from that, nothing. They had Rick Rude beating Jimmy Snooker. Jimmy Snooker had been like out of pro wrestling for ages at this point. So I don't know why he was in this match or why he came back. But he was alright. This match is pretty good. The, that match and the Ted DiBiase, Jake Roberts match was probably the best two matches on the card. The Dusty Rhodes match was quite good and fun. And then we had the world title match. And it says on the back here, I'm going to read it exactly what it says. World title match. Ultimate Warrior versus Hollywood Hogan. This is WrestleMania 6. This was filmed in... I'm going to have to do the maths here. 96 was 12, so 6 was 1990. This is filmed in 1990. Hulk Hogan didn't become Hollywood Hogan until 1996, six years after this. So as it, why does it say on the back, Hollywood Hogan? I didn't notice, it does say it on the other side as well, Hollywood Hogan versus Randy Savage for the WrestleMania 5 card. So I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but... There it is. Hollywood Hogan. So yeah, that's a bit of a typing error on the back of this DVD, so if you got it, maybe that's worth a bit more because of the typing error, I don't know. I've got it, so it would be for me. But yeah, Ultimate Warrior vs Hulk Hogan. The one thing I will say about this match, going into it, was the crowd were fucking amazing. For a match between two guys, like I said with Dino Bravo and Jim Duggan, for a match with two guys that are really limited, the crowd were really, really hyped up for this. They were electric. It was almost on par with the John Cena CM Punk match from uh, Money in the Bank last year, 2011. Although the in-ring quality was not as good either. Where the crowd were really up for it. This is Hulk Hogan versus the Ultimate Warrior. If you were a kid at the time, you were a fan of either of these two camps. Are you in Team Hogan or are you Team Warrior? This will all come full circle now, WrestleMania 28, when they do the same thing again. Team Cena, Team Rock. But just a different vibe. This one, however, is two guys who are in the current. This is Hogan and this is Warrior. Both guys are active right now. In, in 1990. Hogan the world champ, Warrior the IC champ and the ultimate warrior in this match wasn't fantastic but the way he had the crowd behind him really has me respecting him because he played his character well and that's what all pro wrestlers need to do no matter how good you are in the ring if you don't play your gimmick well you are not going to get over with the fans. Chris Benoit although he was an amazing wrestler also played that um, crippler character very very well William Regal, great wrestler, plays his character really, really well. But then you get guys like, um, I don't know, say you put Danny Hodge into the now and say, right, you go and wrestle. He wouldn't be able to get it. He wouldn't be able to do it properly. Someone like Chael Sonnen from uh, UFC, he could come into the World Wrestling Federation. I fucking hope he does one day come to the WWE and really make it happen. But this is what I'm talking about. Luke Warrior, even though he wasn't a great wrestler, he could make it happen with his character. There's a, this is basically like rest holds all the way through the match. Like they did a, a test of strength, and we've all seen the picture where it looks like Warrior's noshing Hogan off, or, or the little, um, little video things called, I don't know what they're fucking called. Um... Where Warriors like that, and you can just see the back of his head on like Hogan's crotch, and it's weird. But yeah, it's just stuff like that all the way through the match. But the crowd was so into it, the crowd really wanted to know. And Hogan hits the big boot on Warrior, goes back, 
goes for the leg drop, slam on the floor, but Warrior's got up, Warrior then jumps up, dives on him, pins him, referee, one, two, three, as he counts three, Hogan pushes Warrior off, we've got a winner, Ultimate Warrior's beaten Hulk Hogan, but Hulk Hogan's still looking strong, because he's thrown him off, and he's got back up again, and he's like, Oh no, I've just lost. And Warrior's like, yes, I've just won the world title. This is an amazing storyline for the time. This is by no means a classic in-ring technical wrestling match, but by no means can you discredit this match and its importance in world wrestling history. Ultimate Warrior and Hulk Hogan here put on a good four-star match. And you can say, nah, it wasn't a four-star match because they weren't putting on the moves. But it got you invested because the crowd was so into it. And they were playing their part so well. If you're watching this for the first time and you don't know what happens, you'd be really into this card. Obviously, I knew what happened going into it, but still, I was being invested and I wanted to see how the match unfolded and how it was going because the fans made me care about it. The wrestlers made me care about it. The booking leading into it made me care about it. And this, my friends, is a match I will recommend to everyone. To everyone who says you need to be a fantastic wrestler to work well, watch this match. Warrior vs Hulk Hogan. It might have just been piped in afterwards. But it sounded real, it sounded amazing, and to me, that's what pro wrestling is all about. Don't get me wrong, I fucking love great technical work. Daniel Bryan, Bryan Danielson was my favourite wrestler at, at one time. Chris Benoit was my favourite wrestler up until his demise. Douglas Williams, my favourite guy in TNA. All these guys are great wrestlers. But these two made themselves into great characters. I will never say that Hogan and Warrior are better than those other guys, because in my opinion they're not. But they play their role very well and their role in the grand scheme of pro wrestling is more important because they make the money. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to know your thoughts. I don't know why I say ladies because there's probably no ladies watching this whatsoever apart from Amy probably. Amy, Amy watches my videos but that's about it. So gentlemen, if there are any ladies feel free to comment down below. Gentlemen though mainly because I'm guessing it's all men. I want to know what you think of this down below. I want to know what you think of WrestleMania 6. I want to know what you think about my comments about Hogan and Warrior. I want to know your opinions yourself on Hogan and Warrior. Do you think they deserve any credit whatsoever? Or do you think they're both overrated pieces of shit that made far too much money at the expense of other guys like Bret Hart who were on the undercard here? Guys like Savage. Guys like Rhodes. Guys who are here to entertain you better. I want to know. Please write all your comments in the d comment box down below. That's what it's all about. Hit that subscribe button up there for my WrestleMania 7, which will be coming very, very soon. In fact, I think I'm just going to pop it in the DVD player now. Watch it, review it straight away. I'll get it banged up on YouTube, shall I? Thank you very, very, very much for watching this video. With that, I'll see you later.